So yeah, thanks for uh, taking the time to sit down. Uh, I've enjoyed your work uh, for a while now. And, Thank you uh, very much. We've been like, you know, Twitter, Twitter friendly for a while, but, yeah. uh, you know, this, this, this podcast has been a good way for me to sort of like reach out, just kind of get to know people better. So cool. I think um, just uh, first off, uh, I, I tend to ask people this is, when you, if you have free time, when you have free time, <laughs> uh-huh. uh, what what do you do to occupy that free time lately, if you have it? It's like less and less now, but I don't know. Mm. Even when I did have free time, it's like I, I hate to say that I I play video games and I watch TV shows. Like like what a boring sure. answer that is, right? But like that uh, is not a boring answer at all. No. Uh, uh, right. What 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 do you what do you what 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 games? Oh man, um, let's see. I I still am making my game time every now and then. Um, lately, it's been Monster Hunter, and uh, we've gotten into mm. Final Fantasy fourteen in my house. Ah, <laughs> um, I see. It's uh, I've never really gotten into MMOs before because I don't like how they play generally. Okay, I I'm not a fan of the uh, click a couple buttons in rotation, and it's just like you do your part and mm. uh, i don't know it's, it's not really reaction based like ff14 does have enemies that do aoe attacks so you do have to like move out of range of stuff every now and then but in general i'm sure. much more of an action headed kind of player you know um so the gotcha. game the gameplay does not grip me at all but what does grip me and what has gripped me during these past few months is um the fact that i can interact with people in my house you know mm. <laughs> um, yeah <laughs> which might be like less of a a problem in the coming weeks but just over the past um over the past month or so being able to like there there are clubs in final fantasy 14 <laughs> as as cool as okay. that sounds but it's like um you know people you can buy houses and you can buy apartments in 14 and uh then what people are doing is they're setting up clubs essentially with bars and bartenders and and uh like djs and all that stuff um they're setting them up and then they put out uh, a call on this thing called the the party finder where i think it was originally made for people to find other players to run dungeons with but then now what people are doing okay. is, is they're putting up advertisements for their bars and then you find their bar and you go there and you you just talk to people and it's like wow it's extremely cathartic for the um uh pandemic addled mind to be able just to like meet a stranger even if it's it's essentially just a chat room right or or twitter yeah yeah but it's just like you 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 meet someone and you talk to someone and you say oh i like your outfit and oh how is your day going and it's it's you know extremely benign conversations like that but like man i'm i'm the kind of person where i um i need people like i need to talk to people i need to to just sure. meet people even if they're not sticking around in my life it's just like i like i i like meeting people and hearing about them like that's just mm. it it makes me happy to to hear about a life that is so different than mine you know because i guess it's so easy to get wrapped up in your own that it's, just, it's nice to be yeah. reminded that other people live in different ways um and so i've been basically playing 14 the way someone would be playing second life which is just i was about to say it's just like <laughs> fantasy second life that's all point. it is it's like i really i do not care about the gameplay i do not care about the story mm. i do like making outfits um like i like it, it's like a little fashion simulator with a uh chat room in it for me but it's enough uh, so i've been enjoying that and then so is that primarily what you're doing then is just kind oh, of yes. shooting the shit with people yeah i mean like i play with a friend group and they'll want to go run dungeons and they'll complain that i'm not playing the game enough because i'm so far behind and it's just like look if i was playing this game the way it wanted me to play it i would have stopped already so it's like, <laughs> so that's just uh that's my my final fantasy life well what's been one of the most i guess or one of the most memorable conversations you've had with a stranger in uh in one of these bars oh um you know, they, they do these things in some of the bars called auctions where basically you auction yourself off in, on a stage okay. in front of a crowd. And I think for a lot of people, it's um, it turns into like erotic role playing. <laughs> you know? uh, OK, I but, was about to say. Right. right. Which is also mm. why we started going to these bars was because we wanted to just go and like people watch and just like see what people do in these kind of places. Right. Um, and we started sure. finding 
these uh we started finding these auctions and um people will spend huge amounts of in-game money uh just like you know millions of dollars on people who are advertising themselves as like sometimes they'll say you know i'll, I'll run dungeons with you or i can craft things that um like anything uh. you want that kind of stuff but then some people are like i'm open to cuddles and maybe a little more tee you know <laughs> which is interesting like, all in text form oh of course it's all in text yeah um mm, got it uh-huh mm. uh but you know i mean to each their own i guess uh but they'll they'll spend sure, lots sure. and lots of money and there was a girl that i watched the other night go for just like a ridiculous amount of money and um mm. it was like great for her i don't know why some people go for more than others i guess but um I, I had met up with her then the night after in another place and asked her how it went. And like, she really hit it off with this person that bought her for this crazy amount of money and they spent all night talking and now they're getting in game married um, in, in wow. next week and stuff. And I guess romance can blossom in such a place, right? Like it's, it's, it's all, you know, online and it's all chat roomy kind of stuff, but it's just interesting that I think, um, you know, people really, uh, they fall in love with their own characters and they can really, it, it's, it, even though I, I have a limited amount of time I spend in these places, it's just eye opening to how really, uh, it makes me understand the second life phenomenon when it was happening mm. a lot more. It's like, cause again, I, I can only get so invested, but I remember when second life was so such a big thing it was like people were losing yeah. their lives to it right there was all these news stories about like people are addicted and people just won't come out of the game and like their spouses are crying and it's like jesus like how are people getting so into this but like after playing Final fantasy for like a month i'm like hmm maybe if i didn't have yeah. much else going on <laughs> i could kind of see it mm, that's so interesting like the the, the idea of being like in-game married mm -hmm. like, and it makes me wonder how much how often does it translate to like outside the game, right? right. Like you know, it, it doesn't seem so odd to me. As I don't know, I don't know if you know my my backstory uh -huh. of how I met my my wife. Mm -mm. If you know, are familiar? No. Uh, long story short, for be people who've listened to this podcast, know. But I I I have known my wife since uh, uh, high school from Mario fan fiction communities. Wow. So it's like. So it's like you find, you know, for a lot of, a lot of people that I know, it's like it's not uncommon just find, finding romance can blossom <laughs> in any sort of online field, right? I, uh, I would totally so believe it, it, that people would meet yeah. in this game and then chat for forever and then, like, get to know the real person on the other side of it and then meet up. Like, I don't there's I don't even think that's probably a rare thing anymore <laughs> like right. that people are, are yeah, i imagine that's pretty common, yeah, common. Right. yeah 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 i i have no experience at all with mmos and mm. it i i genuinely have no idea how they play so hearing you say that you have no interest in the gameplay that is interesting to me because so many yep. people get addicted to these things mm -hmm. but like for someone who is just uh just a complete dumb dumb when it comes to mmos <laughs> what do you do in an mmo like just basic combat is it you just like click a thing and they do a thing. Yeah, like, well, I, so I don't, that's okay. the way they're set up. Is I think they originally they were made to allow um, for every player, regardless of like how beefy your computer was, to play over a relatively low bandwidth connection. Right, so you can't do mm. things that are too action based, where you actually have to react to things happening and you have to hit things where they are because where. Like where an enemy is on your screen might not be where they are on the other player's screen I just see. because of the way latency works and stuff. So the way it's all input based where you just say, do this attack and then a timer runs out and then you can do your next attack and then that timer runs out and then you do your next attack. So you, you do things that are called cycles basically, which is just you have a, a list of moves that you do in order and you try and mm. keep doing that list and some of them are complicated. So it'll be like, your, your your one cycle will be like A, B, C, D, and then you'll go back to A, and then you'll have to do D, and then C, and then E, and then B, and then F. And so it's it's like a memorization game to, to maximize your damage output. But like, and some people, I don't know, I guess I could see how that could be addicting because it's really just, in some ways, it's a little bit of a rhythm game kind of aspect where it's, oh, you just, you're okay. reacting to things like that. But uh, for me, it, I don't know, it doesn't click just because i like i've been tag teaming basically 
Final Fantasy and Monster Hunter at the same time. And every time I turn on Monster Hunter, it, like it scratches that itch. I'm like, oh. Mm, video games right? <laughs> like like i have to do the right thing at the exact right time or i die and then in final fantasy it's it's just very much more i don't it's all menus i guess and it, i don't know it, it's uh, I, I don't want to disparage people that love it but it is yeah it's like pulling teeth for me you're more kind of like the the twitch based like kind of like oh reaction yeah. go go for the weak point sort of thing <laughs> right it. yeah i gotta um like i don't like necessarily games that are always hard all the time but uh mm-hmm. I, I do have to feel like i'm doing the right thing in the moment and sure with, with final fantasy it, it you are but you aren't i don't know you should give it a try like it's they have free trials that you just you hop on and you can see um if you like it it's like a free month and it, it like mm. it has its charm but the the gameplay is just not for me and i, I think uh, the reason it is like that is kind of going back to what I was saying earlier, where like everyone should be able to play it. You know, it's like um, sure. there's lots of people that are not good at action games uh, and I do not fault them for that. Right. Like they deserve to have their games that they can play where, um, you know, they, they can ease their way in and not have to dodge everything at the exact right moment and all that stuff it's like this is the the reason why mmos are so big is because their barrier of entry is very low they're just very accessible um i see and and that's and more so about getting stuff as opposed to the actual gameplay being super difficult right it's about it's all about leveling up getting all that progression Mm -hmm. yeah it's like getting your new armor getting your new weapons like you just you keep progressing in in uh increments and stuff like that and that's what that's what makes it engaging um but i don't know mm. I, I might be wrong people might hear this and and say like <laughs> they, oh i love the gameplay it's super engaging to me but I, I feel like it's the least attractive part of the experience got it well then i guess sort of uh going to it on a general scale here mm. then what are some of your favorite just video games of just in general like your your absolute you know gems of in the in the video game sphere maybe my favorite game of all time is a game that was on ds and 3ds that uh, i Mm. don't think it ever no it didn't ever come over here uh it was going to it's called uh band brothers which is a rhythm game band brothers Mm -hmm. okay it sounds familiar so it is the most bare bones presentation rhythm game you'll ever see it's um is this Daigasso? Yeah, yeah, Daigasso Band Brothers. Yeah, I've heard of this. Yeah, so okay. okay. Mm. It is um like I'm rhythm games are my favorite games, period, just because like, again, they, like they, they scratch an itch in my brain that just like it feels so good to push button at the right time, right? Um <laughs> and yeah. uh Band Brothers, again, it's like it's so bare bones, you look at the screen and it's in a lot of ways it's actually pretty ugly looking. Um, but it's uh it's a scroll based thing where you know, like you see the buttons you're supposed to be pushing coming and you push them at the right time and yada yada, rhythm game mm. uh, stuff. But where Band Brothers hits it just right is, so you have up, down, left, right, A, B, X, Y as your inputs for possibilities of, of notes. And then you can also, you hold L and then up, down, left, right, A, B, X, Y, or hold R and all the face buttons and um, it, it switches from sharps to flats so oh okay so it like in most rhythm games you have basically like like five six seven or so possible input combinations usually right like in Mm -hmm. your guitar heroes and stuff like that it's like you have like five frets or um like pop and music i think you have like it's it's six or six or eight total like usually that's like the max Mm -hmm. range but with band brothers it's um it's like 16 no 24 right with all that eight times wow. three right so you have 24 possible inputs that could be coming at you at any second and it's insane but when you get it right you feel like some kind of god that like you somehow managed to to hit l and switch over to r and go back to your flats and your things and it's just it it, it ramps up to a degree that is just mind-boggling and just when you hit it it feels so good and it's also all midi based so um any person oh, okay. can submit their uh beat map to the the actual in-game store 
I mean, this is probably why it never came over here and why it only was able to fly in Japan is because the the store in game is filled with copyrighted music. But it's just ah, like okay. any game or any song you could ever think of is there to get. Um, and so mm. like I could get all my favorite like J-pop songs. Like as soon as they come out, someone makes a MIDI map for it and it's up on the store and you buy it. And uh, and there it is. And it's just, uh, man, I don't think I've ever. Basically how Beat Saber is now then. Kind of how people make their own maps. Right, exactly. Sort of thing. Mm, um, got it. Yeah. Um, but like rhythm games. Um, it's been so long since a game like moved me. And I think this is like a, a thing that comes with age maybe. It's just, you know, you, sure. you see so much that um, it takes something really special to kind of even register a blip on your radar. Uh-huh. Um, yeah. Yeah. I don't know. It's Can you think of the last game that did that for you? Probably Monster... No, no, Monster. Um, Breath of the Wild, I think, honestly. Mm, okay. Like, I think that's yeah. a game that... It's one of those ones where people talk about it so much that it feels a little trite, maybe. But it's like, it really did do something mm. that I don't think I had experienced before that. It was like... Sure. It, just in the first hour or so... Um, like, or once you get off that first plateau in the game and you climb your first wall and you realize that, oh, there are no invisible walls in this game, right? Yeah, it's yeah. like like th that flipped a switch in my mind where I just started going wherever I wanted to. And it's something that I don't like, even in open world games where you can't, you can't technically go where you want. It just felt different in Zelda for some reason. Like I think it all mm. comes down to that wall climbing aspect where in yes. a normal game you see a wall or you see a building or you, you see something that you know of like oh that's the end of where i can go but in zelda it was just here's a wall it's impossibly tall but can i climb it are there enough little rocks for me to catch my breath in between that i can get all the way up and like i think when you're heading to the first like kakariko village or, or whatever the village is um the, the japan themed mm -hmm. one it's like the game is obviously telling you to go on this path through this the winding uh, canyon and I was just like nah I'm gonna climb this wall instead it's just like and I just found enough little footholds to get my um, uh, stamina back and I made it all the way up and I found uh, one of those big stone like Tartarus creatures or something like that and it was like, mm. one shot and killed me and I was like I definitely wasn't supposed to go there but man that was really fun <laughs> like it just yeah it took the it, it took the binders off um, your your brain about like what you could and and, and couldn't do and what you were supposed to be doing that just and it, yeah it really got its claws on me for a long time yeah it's constantly rewarding you like it makes you feel like you're you know breaking or hacking the game mm -hmm. almost right like doing skips but no the game is actively encouraging you to be adventurous and rewards you for mm -hmm. for doing so like you know, i i always love hearing how different people's experiences with it are like yeah you know whether whether it's in what order they discovered the temples or or just how they found certain things you mm -hmm. know yeah it uh it truly was and just an incredible game yeah my, my yeah. wife was playing it right next to me um usually like you know in bed we would play uh, on our switches before we went to sleep sure and like I, I would look over at what she was doing and she was just like playing a completely different game than me somehow right <laughs> like like she was going where the game was basically telling her to go like along the paths and going to this village and i was just like off in god knows where like doing god knows what um mm. and it was just really like we started at the exact same time but for however you know it worked out we just ended up playing it completely That's different yeah it was really interesting now uh with uh as time is going on and you know you may be let, let's say allowed to pursue other things outside of your home <laughs> uh what are you hope like are, is there any sort of hobbies or pastimes you're looking forward to when you're you know uh given more freedom to venture yeah. out into the world oh god i cannot wait for the gyms to open well, i mean the gyms in california have opened back up but we haven't gone back to them yet um Mm -hmm. I, I don't think our yeah. our brains are quite there just yet. Um, sure. But that was, um, I guess, speaking of other pastimes that I actually do like, like I love weightlifting. Um, I have since high school. Mm. It's always been um, a hobby of mine. Um, and it has been the hardest thing about the quarantine, like 
easily uh, for me. Yeah. Like I can give up a lot of stuff. I can give up movie theaters and I can give up concerts and bars and all that stuff. Um, but but giving up the gym is like the the hardest mental blow that I've taken. Um, just be, sure. because I think it's for me it's it's this big weighted balance to how I live the rest of my life, which is just like work, work, work and sit. Like my Mm. my work is requires me to just sit in a chair and stare at a screen and click buttons and and draw and do all that all day. And so this little bit of balance to that is that for an hour a day, I get to go to the gym and be as active as I possibly can. Mm. And like that swings that pendulum for me so that it like, I actually have some kind of balance in, what i'm doing with my body like it just shakes all the dust off it just it it loosens up all my joints like um it it clears my brain uh like when i don't exercise i fall into depression really easily it's like there's just brain chemicals Mm. whatever however my brain works like if i don't have that active element it's just it all shuts down um and so you know i set up like a little home gym uh, I'm doing air quotes when I say that um, just on my landing uh-huh. where it's like I have a, like a little bar and I have uh, some weights and stuff, but I can't go above a certain limit or else it becomes too loud for my neighbors um, and also just too big mm. to fit the space. So it's like I have some stuff here that I've been keeping myself occupied, but it's like I can't lift heavy and I haven't been able to lift heavy for a year and a half now. And it's like that is uh, we actually we went to a a little beach vacation last weekend and the hotel had a gym that me and my wife went uh and spent like mm. an hour and it was like god it was like opening the gates of heaven for me to walk into this this <laughs> hotel gym and just like but they had a bar that had more than 150 pounds on it you know so i could finally try and get some of my old uh mojo back and just like for an hour i was just in heaven in there i was like god please give me the gym again (laughs) did it uh, after i mean this may seem like a stupid question but after like a year or so how how big of a difference did it feel getting going back uh into the gym uh getting to lift those weights as opposed to if you had kept up with it throughout like i mean did it feel like you'd almost deteriorated or (laughs) uh or what so i think Luckily, even though I haven't had the heavy, heavy weights here at home, I have been keeping up with just my routine. Uh, so I hadn't lost mm. too much. Like I, right before quarantine started, I just hit my my one time max on the bench was uh, 300, which was a goal that mm. I was just aiming for for a while. And I finally hit it. And then as soon as quarantine started, I was like, well, there goes that. Um, yeah. And uh, like... I have 140 pounds max that I can lift here at home, uh, but I've just been switching it out with more. <laughs> I hope I hope anyone finds this interesting, like anyone that is interested in exercise. But it's like there's two ways of working out, right? Which is um, uh, it, it's your reps and, and your weight balance, right? So you can do mm. less repetitions with higher weight, or if you have lower weight, you just do more repetitions. Um, so that's what I've been doing. I've just been doing more repetitions and it's been keeping me alive. Uh, but you know, going Mm. into the gym, I was able, or that hotel gym, it was like, things were fine, but I was not lifting 300 pounds on the bench anymore. And it's like, like for me, it's, it's really, I do the weightlifting now because it, it helps me work better. You know, like I I can live Mm. without being a big muscly beast or whatever like that like that's not my necessarily life goal but when i do keep up my body stuff it makes me work better uh and so that's why it's so important to me so as as long as i'm staying active and as long as i'm um not uh disregarding my my health like that's really just the most important thing to me so uh, sure it's been okay yeah it's funny you mentioned like oh does anyone think this is interesting for me hearing Anyone talk about shit that they're passionate about? That is always interesting to me. <laughs> like, like seriously. Like, I, I, uh, I'm curious as to sort of. You said you were, you've been you've been doing weightlifting since high school. Mm-hmm. Is that right? Yeah. Uh, what sort of prompted 
the initial dive in? Was it just a recommendation by someone, or was it mm-hmm. was it always like, hey, to help with my with art, or what? What, what was the it was the sort of impetus? So I, I grew up. I was actually a really heavy kid up until uh, my last couple of years mm. in high school, um, and I was you know kind of. Well, not kind of. I was a, I was a giant nerd. Uh, I didn't mm. have a lot of friends because I didn't know how to get myself out there. You know, um, like I went to, sure. to church every week with my family, and like that's where most of my friends were. But like mm. at, when it came to school, I just didn't get it. You know, I was just a kind of heavy set nerd um, with no like fashion sense and like a bad haircut and. Uh, that was just kind of my high school life. I mean, I'm sure, you know, for sure. many people, that's how high school was, but me too. Um, and then one day, uh, my friend Dan, who was one of my church friends, um, came to church and it was like noticing that he was, his arms were getting big and we just started talking about it. And he's like, yeah, there's a weight class at our high school that I didn't know about. Just, you could take mm-hmm. it as an elective. Um, but it's like, it's fun and you should do it. And I said, okay. Because, I mean, like, my other options were something like shop or some other boring thing. So, I was like, I'll do a weight uh-huh. class. Why not? Like, it's better than re- – oh, you could actually – you could sub your regular PE class with it, which is the big reason that I did it. Oh, shit. Because okay. nice. as, as a heavy boy, I hated running that track. Like, there is mm. nothing worse than making a heavy kid run track when they don't want to. <laughs> it's like – Sure, it, sure. It's just like, God, you get winded and everyone's passing you. It's like, all the things about high school that make you feel bad about yourself come to a head in PE, mm. right? And so, I was like, yeah. as long as I don't have to run, I'll, I'll take whatever else. So, I took this this gym class, which replaced my PE. And um, it's just – I think when you first start doing a little bit of it, after having no experience, it's like you you shoot right up. Like you you plateau soon, mm, but um, like you sure. immediately like just after like two weeks of lifting weights, you'll see your arms getting bigger, you'll see your shoulders getting wider, um, and it's like wow, that's kind of cool. Just as a as like a a control over your body uh, way of looking at it, it's like this this thing yeah. that I didn't think I had much control over is like just after cursorily doing two weeks of this as a school assignment is like, I've noticed that I've changed Mm. something about something that I didn't really think I could. Um, and, and I think that's the addiction for most people in, uh, like weightlifting and and body transformation kind of stuff. It's just like your body, um, until you try and take control of it, it just seems like this kind of thing that it just Mm. does its own thing and you kind of deal with it sometimes. Right. Um, but it's, it's like, it's just the idea that you can can take this thing and you can make it do what you want, even if it's hard work, is just uh, there. There's a a real addicting quality to that that you you see, like you just see how far can I push it, right? How much more can I do? How big can I get this part of me, and how small can I get this other part of me? Um, mm. Some some to that that I think it's just it keeps you interested no matter how long you keep doing it because you can never really sure you can never really peak right like you you think you can't but like there are people that just do this for a living and uh Mm -hmm. it's never any easier for them and uh like you're just constantly chasing this this version of yourself that you may never even get to but it's that chase that makes Mm -hmm. it interesting it's like I would love to look like Spider Man one day, man. But like, it's it's really hard for me to keep weight off. Still, like even now, um, sure. it's like I can build muscle pretty easily, but it's still really hard for me to to get skinny. And it's like I have this idea that in my mind is like, wouldn't it be cool if I just looked <laughs> like Spider Man, right? And like, it, I may never get there, but the idea that I could keeps me chasing it. Yeah, because even if you don't, it's still just good for you. And, right. You know, yeah. Right. There's just, there's no loss to that. It's like uh right. it's it just keeps um keeps you going. And and again, yeah, it makes me be able to sit in my chair and work better by balancing it out um after hours. Mm, nice. Um now uh I like to actually um uh, let the guest uh have the opportunity to is there uh either a topic that you would like to bring up mm. or a question for me you'd like to ask. And if not, don't worry about it. <laughs> we can talk about other shit. But I, it's a common, it's something I like to uh, offer the guest if they're interested. Uh, I guess, you know, when when you uh, opened the show up, 
um yeah you said that mm-hmm. we've been twitter friendly for a while <clears throat> um sure um but i i've actually have not been on twitter like at all over the past year or so um Mm -hmm. and i I feel like for for me i'm getting to this point where i don't feel um i feel like it's not like a place for for me anymore and i think you you probably have Mm. way more followers than me at this point um but uh i got to a point on twitter where i i felt like the reason why i loved it so much originally was i loved interacting with people um and i loved being able to talk to people uh because i felt like um because I felt like I was more down on, it felt more equal and even to me. Um, and I felt like yeah. if I talked to someone or if I disagreed with them, I, I could disagree with them and that would be fine. That would be part of the discussion. But I feel like now my interactions have to be positive or it elicits a firestorm in the direction of someone that I don't necessarily want to be destroyed, right? But I also might not sure. agree with them. And like, but those are, that's my options, right? It's like, I have to either stay positive or just stay out of it. And so it gets to this point where it's like, well, now I just feel like I'm being disingenuous because like, Mm. there's no way I could say a hundred times, please don't attack this person I'm talking to, or, or please don't go after this. And it's just, nobody listens to that. Right. It's like, it, it, it almost seems like that in itself is a disingenuous statement because you know, people are going to do whatever they want. And, and people, if you have right. a lot of followers, um, they're going to follow you and they're going to like stick up for you and they're going to fight your battles for you. And so, I don't know, it just became this place where it's like, I don't really know what to do with this platform anymore. It's like when you, when you get to be a certain size, it's like, do you still get to interact with people in, in a genuine way or do you just have to leave it behind? I don't know. I, I feel alienated mm. from it. Um after especially after the sonic movie stuff like because things really blew up then and uh i mean the the sega sonic stuff blew up in its own way but especially after the movie stuff it's like i feel like my my presence on twitter became such that i just i didn't feel like i could be as open and, and normal and and honest with people as i used to be sure just because of the amount of people that seem to all of a sudden be agreeing with me on everything i said right it's like (laughs) i I don't know it's i don't know even what i'm trying to thought i'm putting together here but um i I guess for someone i i i I get the gist yeah yeah yeah. like i guess how are you feel about twitter as as you've gotten um bigger and uh Sure. Like, do you still um, feel like you can interact with people on a genuine level? Are we talking about people we like that I know, or people that I don't know, or both? Um, maybe, maybe both. I think they're two different subjects, actually. Now that you bring it up, because I've always... uh, yeah, but I was wondering what you were referring to. Were you talking about people that you like, like strangers, or people that you know, like outside of Twitter, or um, even just on Twitter initially? I think broadly, I'm talking about everyone, but I think it's it's mm-hmm. worth stating that now that you you bring up the division, there, it's like uh, you know, there there are people on Twitter that I've been friends with for years and years, but I even now find myself not talking to them as much because I don't want to have my conversation with them have a spotlight on it necessarily. Mm. Like sometimes I just want to say a little thing to a friend, but then I'll say a little thing yeah. to a friend and 50 people will like it. And I was like, well, like I, it's not that I don't appreciate that people are agreeing with me or, or liking the statement, but it, it just, it, I don't know. It puts this weird cloud over every interaction where it's like that wasn't supposed to be a performative statement right it wasn't something that i said for applause or or for approval or disapproval it was just i wanted to say something to a friend and it was supposed to be for them right (laughs) like but Mm. but there is no person to person uh contact anymore it's when, when you get to a certain size everything you say is in a way performative because it's going to be sure. performed. Sort of my experience with it is um, if we're talking about like, so I, I use Twitter very selfishly in that <laughs> I kind of, I mean, a lot of people say this, but I generally do kind of feel this way in that I don't really care if like, uh, with that said, I can't just tweet whatever I want. Right. right? Like, like you said, you know, uh, I think one thing that I have noticed for sure is like, let's say I don't like something. Mm-hmm. 
uh, like a movie that came out. Right. I don't necessarily put it out on Twitter, right? right. I'll usually just talk to my friends about it, right? Yeah. Because mm-hmm. what it does is it invites just a bunch of people to be like, well, blah, 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 <laughs> right? Right. Um, so that's, that sort of stuff has changed for sure. Uh, I, as far if, if we're talking about engaging with uh, people I don't know on Twitter, mm. I actually almost never do. Yeah. Uh, uh, th- I mean, <clears throat> I think um, earlier on, you know, a long time ago, that would have been different, where mm-hmm. I would have been more likely to respond to, like, um, someone I don't know, mm-hmm. a reply or whatever. But uh, these days, I pretty much don't almost ever. Right. Uh, and, and I often uh, don't really... I mean, I'd be lying if I said I didn't look at replies, but mm-hmm. I tend to not look at, like, everything. Right. right? I think I think that's just best for, you know mental health right. but uh as far as a platform to sort of meet other people mm-hmm. i find it's been useful to kind of start the initial meeting with people right? right like or getting or just getting to know what a person's vibe is what they're like and like is this somebody that i would like want to kind of get to know outside of twitter mm-hmm. uh because you know i've made a, i've made some you know very very good friends you mm-hmm. know just initially just kind of following each other but as I realize, oh, we have very similar interests, or oh, like you know, oftentimes for me, it's like if I if anyone is like, oh, you play board games because I'm, I'm a big board gamer. <laughs> right, it's one of my huge hobbies. It's like, oh, you play board games. Well, let's play sometime. You know, <laughs> right. And I I think what's been helpful for me is that most of my socializing with with people is going to be either in an in person basis, mm-hmm. and well, during quarantine that was tougher. Right. That was more Discord stuff, right? Mm-hmm. Like Discord servers, Discord voice chats Mm -hmm. you know um that's going to be primarily where i interact with people whereas twitter as now i'm very aware that it is kind of like a public forum for people to just see you know but i i try to not think of it as like oh this is performative Mm -hmm. uh i i i think my general rule of thumb with online my sort of online presence has been to just kind of be myself and mm-hmm. i think that's what people respond to like yeah. i don't i'm not or i like to think anyways i'm not i'm not like a fucking phony baloney on right there, or on any any sort of whether it's on youtube whether it's on twitter whether it's you know mm-hmm. even this right this podcast i'm i'm pretty much this is what you get right. i if you don't like it that's f- honestly fine right <laughs> like it's okay mm-hmm. uh I, I i'm not super bothered by it and i think that's what has kept twitter fun for me mm-hmm. is that i've been un uh, stubbornly uncompromising on how i present myself and uh mm-hmm. do shit online i guess is. Mm-hmm. but i think that's easy but that's also easier i think for someone maybe like me where uh i feel like with maybe with like actors or something mm-hmm. or youtube people or whatever you know people kind of want to see your real personality, right? right? Like some people put upon personas, right? They put right. on like their their on self or whatever. Mm-hmm. And I tend if 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 someone acts like that on Twitter, I tend to be very put off. Like I right. not interested in you can, really, you can sniff it. Unless I I absolutely sniff it and yeah. I have really no patience for it. <laughs> right. Like I would much rather get to know just like, you know, what you are for real. But mm-hmm. um but I, I think there's an expert, there's a sort of a desire from the audience to like see that from let's say an actor or a YouTube creator. Right. Whereas maybe you know someone in your position where it's you know you're you're known for you know your your work mm-hmm. or your art and you know it's not necessarily I mean it's something where you know Sonic let's say let's say generally speaking like so, people who are fans of Sonic mm-hmm. and who are following you for Sonic. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think a lot of them are very interested in the Sonic, and I, I'm sure some of them are, and a good number of them are also interested in your in your thoughts. But it also becomes this weird, you know. You'll see with a lot of um, people who become showrunners or people mm-hmm. become they where they just don't want to deal with the drama, right. right? Of the of a rising singular fandom, mm-hmm. right? You know, you you'll you'll see like uh, writers and storyboarders of shows who get attacked right. by their fandom because it's such a giant wall of people just watching you whereas i think for my audience it's it's a mix mm-hmm. right some people know me for voiceover some people know me for youtube some people know me for just all sorts of different things so it, it doesn't feel as overwhelmingly like 
ah, yes, if you say something wrong about this, mm-hmm. all my audience is going to go after me. Right. I have found that, you know, people, fans that I've met at, like, conventions or even in person have been all relatively, like, chill, like, nice people that, like, don't know me for one thing and also don't, aren't going for my throat, right. <laughs> you know? Uh, they tend to, like, the people who do that are tend to not be following me or wanting to see my tweets anyway. I think um, you, so that you may be a difference. Yeah. You, you honestly, you may have kind of hit something there that I hadn't really thought about was when I stopped being more open and candid on Twitter was right about the time where um, it was just very obvious that a large portion of the people following me were following me for one singular thing. And that was the Sonic mm, stuff. It's like before sure. that it was, you know, um, I was doing my own web comics. I was just doing my own stuff and my own stories. Um, and I felt like mm-hmm. my Twitter was an extension of me and th- that people were there for me because they're there for my stories and they're there for my jokes and all that stuff. And then a- as soon as, I mean, I would say probably even at this point, geez, like 60% of the people following me on Twitter don't give two shits about anything I've done other than Sonic. And like, that's fine. Like it, mm. that that's always been something that, it never really dinged my ego that should I walk away from Sonic today, there goes half the people that ever cared about me. Like it, it doesn't phase me. Um, cause it, they're, mm-hmm. that's their right. Like, right. They don't like me. They like Sonic and they like what I do with Sonic and that's totally fine. Um, sure. There's been creators that I've liked what they've done with one thing and then not their next thing. And like, that's, that's okay. Mm-hmm. It's like, we're not sure we're not, um, in a deeper relationship than that. And I think that's, there's uh, that's a healthy way of looking at it. Um, yeah. But I do think that I became very, very aware of, of who was following me and for what. And I think uh, a kind of wall went up where I thought one, now it's a lot of kids, which was something that mm. I really had to pivot to was, was before sure. Sonic, I was doing stuff that was not like adult, but it was, you know, adult swim level of adult i guess right it's like sure for, sure. for teens or whatever but i was i i swore and i i you know would tell a dirty joke every now and then um and mm. uh when when kids started following me like i immediately just i had to take responsibility for that i guess right like yeah. I, I didn't mm-hmm. want any kid to follow me and then like I would say something off color and then they would be like, Oh, am I supposed to be here? Or like, what if like their, their parents read their Twitter feed and they're like, who is this that you're following? And like, this is the Sonic guy. Oh my God. <laughs> like, he's just right, like, right. this is so awful. Like, and I, I don't know. I, I feel like that really just shut me up real quick where it's like, now I basically live in kids media space. Um, and, mm, yeah. and, and there are a lot of uh, creators that I think, just keep being themselves. And I, there's, I don't hold that against them at all. Like I'm, uh, I envy them that they don't feel that the pressure, but like I have it in my mind that so many of the people that are following me are following me for kids media or kids friendly media. Um, and I mm. have to reflect that because I, I just don't want to upset any kids, I guess. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. Which is, which is again, weird because it was never a place that I felt like I wanted to end up. Um, I, I still mm. feel like the jokes I want to tell necessarily or the stories I want to tell aren't necessarily um, kid level stuff. But uh, I, I guess the older I get too, the more I look back at stuff that inspired me and it makes me want to create stuff on that level. Um, mm. Because when, when you work in kids media for long enough, you realize how hard it is to get anything of substance out the door it's like i i I feel like there's a lot of cartoons now where you know uh creators are putting their their personal thoughts and their personal spins and their emotions into things in a way that's been um not not done very well over the past like 30 years or so but in in a lot of ways Mm. it's also becoming much more sanitized and it's like you you want to fight for things that say or you want to fight to be able to make things that say something and it's sure. it's really really hard uh like 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 disney has some like good kids shows coming out that that say some good stuff and like there's, there's your steven universes of the world and stuff but i guess um mm-hmm. for every one of those shows where a creator is really getting to speak their heart and, and say something there's just a hundred other shows where 
is just m- nothing. Um, and, <laughs> sure. You know, and, and I don't know, I guess I look back at stuff when, when we were growing up, like our kids media was, was much um, more bold if also not mm. dealing with its own restrictions at the same time. But I guess, you know, when I look back and we think, of what kids movies were when we were kids that was stuff that was like spielberg stuff was kids movies right which is Mm, um like goonies was like a kid's movie right like like that kind of stuff Mm -hmm. is stuff that you just you could not do and sell as a kid's movie nowadays right like i i feel like kids are probably watching stranger things right for example um sure but they are not making that for kids Right. right. Like if if someone if the guys that are making Stranger Things said, I want to make this show for kids and it's going to be like all of this, like they never would have been able to make Stranger Things the way it is. Right. Like with the violence mm. or all that stuff. Um, it's like you right. have to make right. it as like a nostalgia piece and, and say it's like a Spielbergian and, and that's how they, they make it. It's like it's for all audiences, but kids are the ones that are really probably like falling in love with that stuff. And, and like. Uh, this is kind of turning into word salad. Uh, I'm trying to like, like put my my thoughts together a little bit. But I guess I just no, I, no, no, no. Like I look back at, at the stuff, like the movies that really stuck with me as a kid, and there are so many moments that I just know can't fly when you try and make mm. it now. Um, sure, it's it's just so much more strict. Um, even like in, in Sonic stuff, where it's just like, man. I want to be able to do this emotional beat or, or do this joke. And it's just like at every chance you're shot down, it's like, no, kids don't, kids don't get that. That's too dark for kids. And everybody's like, but it's not like, it, it's really not. Kids right. are really, they're smart and they're, they're learning and they need to be introduced to concepts in safe spaces where they can process them. Yeah. You know, and it's like, man, I, I just, I, I want to fight for good media for kids. Um, and so that's why I, I, can end up sticking around in this this world um but i think mm. like as i'm doing that i'm also like self sanitizing myself on twitter and uh mm. maybe that makes me a hypocrite i don't know <laughs> i don't think that, i don't think so at all i think um you know you look at shows like uh steven universe and all these shows that the ones that are like affecting positive change and really being bolder but it's mm-hmm. you know you also you then hear about all the behind the scenes the struggle to right. do so like you know all the executives were in their way to uh basically not let them do any of that you right know? this and despite despite all that is what makes those shows so special right uh i mean you know i'm sure i know i know it's like a mixed there's it's always gonna be a mixed bag mm-hmm. i think every i think every success is always gonna be a mixed bag right, right? so it's like you know I imagine for you, or not I imagine, I'm sure for you, like, you know, getting to work on official Sonic shit mm-hmm. was a dream, you know, it was a dream of yours, mm-hmm. I'm sure. Uh, is that fair to say? <laughs> you know, I, you know it, it is isn't. Familiar- <laughs> it's, it's funny because it, it isn't, it isn't. Um, like, I have always mm. been a huge Sonic fan, like, just unwavering, sure. even through all, like, the years where everyone said everything was bad and, like, Sonic was like you know how could you like sonic and like you bring them up and you get laughed at it's like like it never stopped me from liking sonic and like um but at the same time i never viewed it as an option right i think like every kid Mm. like when you're like 12 or 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 that kind of age and you think man i'm gonna grow up and i'm gonna work for square enix you know or i'm gonna work for sega like every kid says that right and then you get older and you realize like oh that's basically impossible i guess i'll do something else (laughs) um like right. I, I did not set my sights on this career path. It was um, mm. like through very fortuitous circumstances, like offered to me, and I was in a position to take it up. And then mm-hmm. from there, um, I became oh man, how to tell this story without being too incriminating? I was put into this position to to do this thing that should not have been able to be done which is mm-hmm. make Sonic cartoons um, for, sure. for like Sega internally, right? Like it, it hadn't been mm-hmm. done before because it shouldn't, be, like it's an albatross of a project, I guess. Like it shouldn't be able to fly is, mm-hmm. is how it worked out. It was like we, we made um, the Sonic Mania intro, we made Sonic Mania Adventures for just um, an amount of money that if you put in front of any seasoned cartoon maker it would get you laughed out of the building, right? But like w- we made it work because... Sure. Um, just coincidentally, you know, I was the person that they asked to do this stuff. And whenever anything went wrong, I was yeah. 
luckily, I had the skill set where I could take over any part of the production and pick it up where the the money fell out, basically. So if mm. if we had a shot that needed reanimating, but we didn't have the money to get an animator on it, I would reanimate it. If we needed uh, compositing to be done, I could composite it. If we needed sound design to be done, I could do that. Sure. Like, it, it put me in this position where it's like Sega, you know, would, would keep coming back to me because it was just, man, like, you'd have to hire five other people to fill my position. And it's just like, we'll just keep working together because it's, it's working like that. Um, but like that, that all happened just by circumstance really It's like, again, I didn't apply for this position. I, I wasn't thinking I'm going to grow up and work for Sonic and I'm going to keep making Sonic stuff until they notice me and, and all that stuff. It was like, like I've always loved Sonic, but I've always been more interested in telling my original stories first and, and foremost. Um, mm. And I think that's where a lot of people get lost that want to do what I'm doing now, where it's like people that love Sonic so much that all they do is draw Sonic and all they do is create Sonic based stuff. Um, it's like in a way that's inhibiting because it, uh, it limits your scope of what you can bring to Sonic. Right. It's like um, for, for any mm -hmm. franchise, I think like if even if I was working on like a Ninja Turtles or something like that, like and I, was, I was hiring someone that like or I was looking for the creator that I wanted to write my next Ninja Turtle story uh, or my next Smurf story. Hell, sure. any franchise It's like I'm going to look for someone that is writing something unique to them because I want to see what that mm. spin on Sonic looks like. Right. Like if, if I see someone making sonic stuff that it's like super authentic it almost could be official like sonic stuff it's like like they 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 have that inside already right like i that that doesn't really mm -hmm. necessarily do anything for me like i want to see what this person and what their life um and their experiences and their personal spin can do to improve this thing that i'm in charge of um and i think that's that's how i ended up in my position where it's like i wasn't necessarily doing a lot of sonic stuff online um or, or drawing Sonic a lot even is like, but I was proving myself to be someone that was gonna follow through. Right. Like if you asked me to, to do something, it's yeah, like, yeah. that is what got me the offer. And the Sonic stuff was just like, as that stuff kept going, they realized, Oh, we don't have to hold his hand on Sonic stuff, which is something I think when you're a licensor, whenever mm. you hire someone, you're just like, notes 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 like they're getting everything wrong like they're they're drawing this wrong they don't know this thing about the character they don't know this part of the backstory it's like um you know when they hired me it was like they realized they don't have to give notes anymore it's like wow this is really so they didn't know at all about your sonic background uh, not not by all? the time i got offered the sega stuff so like the the the, let's wow. see, the sequence of events here was um so I, I had, have you seen those old Sonic meme comics that I did a long time ago? Um, okay. The mm -hmm. ones. Yeah. Yes. Um, so I, I printed those up as a lark when I got my boxer hockey books printed up. It was like the printer asked if I just wanted to throw a mm -hmm. little mini comic on there because it would be cheaper to print them all at, uh, at once. I was like, sure, I'll print these. Why not? They're kind of popular. It's like six pages. I'll give them away at conventions. Sure. Um, so I printed a bunch of those up. Um, and there was an artist named John Gray who was working on the Archie Sonic comics. Um, great guy. And uh, mm. at a convention, he was over at the Archie booth and I was running my own booth for boxer hockey. Um, and he came by and said, hi. And he said, hey, you should come over and um, say hi to the Archie people. You know, it's like if you ever wanted to like do something with us, that might be fun. I said, oh, sure. Why not? Like, again, none of this was ever on my trajectory right like my, my trajectory was always sure, i'm gonna do sure. my own thing and just hell or high water it's gonna work out or i'm gonna end up homeless right like that was all i ever wanted to do but mm. like you know whenever somebody says hey maybe you should try this i'll be like okay <laughs> put a you put a shiny thing yeah. in front of me i guess mm. i'll bat around for a little while um so I, I went over to the archie booth and i just handed over one of his little sonic meme comics as a joke um, and they thought it was funny. And then from there, they saw the rest of my portfolio and said, oh, you know, would you like to do a cover for Sonic Comics? Um, and I said, sure, that'd be really mm -hmm. actually like a childhood dream come true. Again, not one that I ever would have thought to pursue because I I don't ever think that highly of myself um, 
to think I'm good enough for something. Like usually somebody has to offer it to me and then I'll, I'll show up for it. But like, I, I guess the better way to phrase it is like, if childhood me knew about this, he'd fucking freak out. Not like a necessarily. A right. I mean, yeah, it's that. like when I was doing it, I was like right. super excited for it. I was like, Oh wow. Like this is my own Sonic comic cover. I'm going to do this one and I'm going to put it on my right. wall and I'm just going to put that little notch on my bedpost and then uh, get on with my life. And like, I, that was really all there was to it. Sure. Um, but, uh, you know, the cover went over well and they asked me to keep coming back and doing more covers. Um, and uh, those kept going well. And then they asked me to do the uh, interiors on some issues and then eventually the interiors on the Sonic Mega Drive comic, which was like the, this classic reboot comic that um, had been the first classic Sonic styled thing that uh, they'd done in a long time. And that went over really well. Uh, mm. And I think it was like, that was the first Archie book that they ever had to reprint because it sold so well, um, which is, is not wow. something that I even attribute to myself uh, or, or, you know, people that created the book. It might have been, who the hell knows, it might just be because people really like classic Sonic, right? And I think like when they see classic Sonic, they see a version of him that is unburdened by the weight of uh, the stumbles along the way. Um, but like for whatever reason, it sold really well. And um, Sega asked me to come to the 25th anniversary party where they revealed Sonic Mania and Sonic Forces. Um, and uh, they had me like sign some of the books uh, just like just to be there. And I was like, again, not thinking anything of it. It's like, I'll go and I'll sign some comic books and that'll be great. And then um, the social media manager, and I'm, I'm not going to name any names here because I don't want to put anyone on a particular blast, um, but it, which is all just difficult because mm -hmm. I also want to give them credit. But, you know, um, but the social media manager asked, uh, you know, about getting involved in uh, uh, basically a commercial for Sonic Mania since they had just announced it there. Um, and it was like, we want to do like a 2D animated mm -hmm. commercial, you know, kind of something like the old Sonic CD intro, just something that hadn't been done in a long time. Um, and he said, I know you animate mm. and, and you obviously know you can draw Sonic and, and, you know, all this stuff. You want to take a crack at it. Um, and uh, that was how the process started. And then just internally as checkpoints uh, kept being reached, it's just like it was just going really well. And so uh, it was reconfigured to instead of being a commercial, uh, let's turn it into the intro for the game, actually. And so that made it a little bit longer. And we added mm. some new scenes and stuff to tie it in a little bit further. Um, and uh, this is all thanks to, you know, um, the hard work of there's a studio called Studio Yada who did um, a lot of our animation, um, mm -hmm. did, yeah. clean up and stuff. Um, but it was also me animating alongside them. I think like 90% of all Sonic shots were, were done by me. Um, and then uh, Yada handled mm. most of the other characters and the cleanup and stuff. Um, and then uh, my friend Brady uh, helped uh, Brady Hartel. He composited it all. And, you know, so, I mean, mm. it, was, it was a group effort, but like, really we put it all together I, I didn't make any money on that by the end of it like all all the money that mm. sega gave me went to yada and i was just kind of doing this not thinking about the payday at all it was really just like man uh, i'm getting to make a, sure. a sonic intro uh i'm just gonna do it and if i come out of this destitute so be it it's like but i, I have to do this right like you don't turn down an opportunity like that yeah, yeah. um so like, I, again, yeah. you know, I did that thinking this isn't going anywhere. Uh, I'm just going to do this. And again, I'm going to put that notch on my post and think that was great and go on with my life. Um, but it ended up going so well um, that, uh, you know, they asked me to come in and do cartoons uh, internally and that Sega has never done cartoons internally um, before that point. Right. So it's wow. like. I, this is one of those situations where it was just like, well, this thing that you did worked. Do you want to do it again? And me being uh, a fool said, well, I, of course I do. <laughs> like, do, do I have the resources? Uh, sure. Maybe not, but I guess you asked me, so I guess I'll do it. Um, so, you know, we went in and we made Mania Adventures, which uh, I think looks um, really great for, for what it is. But I think also it um, people don't quite understand it just how much of a miracle is that it looks good at all mm. like the 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 budget that that yeah. thing was made on um was something much much closer to um something that was supposed to be like animated sprite comics basically it was like it was supposed to be something very sure. very simple very basic like the, our original 
when we were kicking around ideas was like, well, we, what can we afford? We can afford to do some like black and white stuff. Like maybe even it's just, it's all pencil test kind of looking stuff where it's just sketches and, um, you know, more simple stuff like that. Mm. Uh, and then it's just like me being the way I am was like, no, we have to make this a real cartoon, give all the money to the animation studio and I'll just do all the rest. <laughs> All right, because like that's the only way that we could afford it was you know we we can't hire um, a bunch of internal artists and we can't hire a bunch of um, crew that you need to make a full cartoon. Uh, but we if we have if we take all the money we mm -hmm. have and we give it to the animation studio, we can afford the animation at least, right? Um, and so it's just mm -hmm. like uh, I end up doing you know five to ten people's jobs for less than what I could have been if I just had stayed at Nickelodeon. Um, but it's like, I did it because it's like, again, opportunities like this don't come along. I, I have to do this. Right. It's like, I love Sonic and like, what right. kind of fool would I be if, uh, I was offered to make a Sonic cartoon and I just said no, just because the money wasn't that great. Um, and, but again, these mm -hmm. things, they, they keep working out. Um, and this is, this is not me saying that like Sega is, um, stiffing me on the bill or anything like that. It was like. I, I repeatedly put myself in a position to be like, I will, I will take no money or less money. Um, if you let me do this basically, because <laughs> the, mm, the other option was right. that it just didn't happen. And, and that was like, like truly it, it wasn't sure. like if I, if I say no, um, someone else is going to get this and they're going to make something bad or whatever like that. It was like, if I didn't say I will do this, it's just like, it wasn't going to happen period. Um, and right. so, uh, like for any shortcomings that those shorts have, it's like, uh, it's still, it's this position. It's like, man, we, we truly did miracles to make that stuff happen. Um, just for, to give fans like a little yeah. free cartoon on YouTube. Um, and it's like, I, I can never mm -hmm. look back at that and think anything other than, um, every, every single person involved in every one of these projects deserves a world of credit because it was just stuff that. Again, we, we did it because we love Sonic and we just wanted to do something that we hoped mm. people would like. And there was really no, uh, there was no like ladder climbing aspects or like none of it was like, we're, we're going to keep getting bigger and bigger and, and doing more and more stuff. It was just like, this is our one shot. So let's, let's do something fun for people. Um, and it just, you know, it ended up paying off. And uh, people liked it. Yeah, I mean, I it really shows through through the work how passionate you all were on it. Like, because it, it not only does it look so good, but it's clearly so much mm -hmm. love is put into it. And uh, uh, I mean, kind of hearing sort of your your sort of story and journey. Uh, while we're kind of <laughs> wrapping up here, it, it just goes to show. I think you know, for a lot of people that I, a lot of people that I meet, it's uh, in the creative in, in creative industries, it's just sort of like a strong work ethic and just sort of this idea of you know a lot of people ask like how do you get how do you get into this how do you get into this and it's a lot of it is just you know building a reputation for yourself of being a good person to work with or hire or whatever and just going at it you know and also uh something that i uh tend you know when you like you said, you're presented with an opportunity and it's like, even though you may not know, oh, am I the best mm -hmm. person for this? But it's like, well, I got to right. I still got to try it. Right. And I definitely can relate to that on on several levels of, you know, sometimes I've been offered something where I'm like, God, I've mm -hmm. never done that before. And I never envisioned that ever being presented right. to me. But uh, I mean, I'm just going to go for it and go for it and, you know, I try my best and. Uh, it usually has worked out, fortunately, but it's you know it it, it takes uh, it takes you know guts right. to do that. So um, uh, yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah. So I think uh, yeah, even though you may have this sort of not mix, but this feeling of like oh, not you know you didn't necessarily f uh, expect to go into kids media. It's like. You're right. making good shit. <laughs> You're making well, good shit, you. and that is that is really a yeah. But it, you know, as you, I'm sure you know, how hard it is mm -hmm. to make good shit yeah. in this realm. Uh, that's the thing is, uh, I, just know that that's thanks. it's appreciated. I, that's, I, I truly wish like th there's no way to really understand it unless you're you're in it. Right. And that's the thing I, I wish so much that I could mm. communicate clearer and more honestly with people, like just 
just how hard it is to get something out the door that is the way you want it to yeah. be you know uh, i think like people people look mm-hmm. at a title like director and they think oh well that guy directed it so he got to do whatever he wants and it's like fuck no <laughs> it's like man not even close <laughs> it's like I especially when it's on a licensed thing like Sonic, I've never been able to do with Sonic what I want to be able to do with Sonic. Like Mania Adventures was maybe the closest mm. thing that I want to do for that particular project, but it's like I, I want to make sure. a, an anime like with Sonic where big cool things are happening and like stakes are at play and it's like dramatic and like Sonic Adventure 1 and 2 are like my gold standards for sonic stories and like that's the kind of stuff i want to be involved in um but like you know we're making youtube Mm. cartoons for pennies so it's like we can't do that kind of stuff right like when when it's when i'm the director of of something it's like i'm i'm doing my best version of what i'm allowed to do with this thing but like no director is fully in charge of his project that's ridiculous like of course not only like even if it's mm-hmm. a director who's directing a version of a story they wrote you know and it's not a licensed thing it's like you're still dealing with producers and you're still dealing with studio heads and you're still dealing with executives and like there's a, a thousand people above the head of a director that are stopping him from necessarily you know for better or worse doing yeah. what uh they want to do and it's just I think uh-huh. credit is it's such a weird thing from the outside until you've been on a production where it's like you you look at a, a credit given to someone and you think, oh, that's what they did. But it's like it never works out to be that simple. Mm. Like on I'm not going to give any details here because I get fired. But like there are there are giant decisions on the Sonic movies <laughs> that were like handled by people whose names you'll never know. And there are great decisions. Um, and there are sure. also some decisions that I don't think are great that will handle by people whose names no one will ever know. It's like like giant things mm. uh, are, are happening behind the scenes um, that just uh, are completely hidden from view. But one person gets the credit for doing it. And that's just the way it's, mm. it's got to be to simplify it, right? Like I wrote some jokes on the sure. first Sonic movie, right? I don't get credited for that. Like my mm. my my title mm. is Sonic designer on the first movie, and like that's that's fine. Like that's the way it it works out. But like like when someone's a director or anything like that, I think people are so quick to assume that this is exactly what they wanted to do, and it's it's just not yeah. that that simple. And uh, mm. yeah, how did I get started on this? Um, <laughs> No, I mean, yeah, I mean, I think a lot of people, as you know, online, especially take production for granted. (laughs) They think everything is so easy. And so like, why didn't they do this? Or why did they do this? And so and when you're involved in the creative process of anything, you, you become more sympathetic to just how difficult it is to get shit made. And I I, I could, I think I could just keep talking. (laughs) But uh, I think I think this is a good place to wrap up. But before, uh, before we we do so first off, thank you again for uh, taking the time to sit down i i uh really enjoyed this chat and Me too. um yeah and also uh where can people find you um well you can uh go to my barely used twitter account <laughs> if that uh is what you want to do <laughs> uh it's just at my name is just at tyson hess h-e-s-s-e i anticipate one day getting back to twitter like if there's a day in the future where I leave Sonic behind and I'm doing personal projects again, I feel like that's when I'll get back to Twitter and start using it as a mouthpiece again. Mm, I think um, sure. until that day comes, I, I feel like uh, I am just going to be the Sonic guy for a little while. And uh, while that's mm. happening, I have to kind of present myself as a Sonic person and, and not say anything too out of bounds for, for what's expected sure. of a kid's franchise. Um, yeah, but uh, yeah. One day, hopefully, I'll get back to being able to draw pictures and post them <laughs> and, and have fun on Twitter again. Yeah, well, I as as someone who thinks your shit's great, I look forward to that happening. Like, and also, I mean, <laughs> yeah, I mean, not to say I don't think what you're doing right now is great. I mean, I think it's mm-hmm. rad as fuck. So Thanks. basically, I'm just I'm just glad that you've been doing well this whole time and oh yeah very excited to see what you have in the future thank you uh, yeah, yeah. I, I definitely I, I cannot complain about my my situation like uh-huh. everybody wants you know uh, to do 
something else and they have their further sights. But like, I truly, uh, I, I feel like I, I gotta be, if not the luckiest guy in the world, one of them, like truly, mm. um, who, who wouldn't trade, uh, their position to be doing the kind of crazy stuff I'm doing right now. It's, it's yeah. really nuts. So I'm very grateful for, for the people that put me here. Nice. Yes. All right. Well, thank you again. This has been, this has been fun. Thank you.